Uh, hello to everyone coming in. We're just letting a few more people join us and we'll get started in just a moment. Okay. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started then. My name is Liza Lester, I'm with AGU Media Relations. I have a few of my colleagues here clustered and we also have Jason from NSF and um, a bunch of his uh, scientists online with us who you probably see um, in the other windows. And there, he, Jason is gonna introduce them and they'll get started on their presentation. And as soon as that's done, you should feel free to jump in with questions. Um, you're welcome to turn on your camera and open your mic as you like, um, or if you're not comfortable with that, just drop a note in the chat if you'd like us to ask a question for you. But this is intended to be very much just a, like comfortable conversation, somewhat informal compared to a press conference. Um, so you can ask anything you like at any time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason. Cool. Thank you, Liza. Uh, I'm Jason Stoughton. Uh, I work at the National Science Foundation, where I do communications and media work. And so thank you, just to, to echo Liza, thank you all for attending, both those of you who are on Zoom and in person. Uh, we really appreciate your interest uh, in this topic. And uh, what we're hoping to do is to uh, share some information with you all that we think uh, you might find interesting. It's centered on the National Science Foundation's Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope, which is new. Uh, and the fundamental research that it is now a part of, which is a huge collaborative multi-agency endeavor to understand the physics of the sun and some of the interesting applications and innovations that can come from that, like improved prediction uh, of space weather to protect satellites and other critical infrastructure. Um, and we're also going to share some information about the upcoming solar eclipses in 2023 and 2024, and how researchers are going to take advantage of the unique scientific opportunities that those eclipses present. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to introduce our panelists who are all with us uh, on Zoom today. Uh, so from your perspective, I'm not sure which direction you'll see, but for me it's below, uh, is uh, Dr. Carrie Black, who's also with the National Science Foundation. Uh, she is the program director for the National Solar Observatory, including the Inoue Solar Telescope. And then to her left, I think, uh, is Dr. Nicolene Vile with NASA, uh, where she is a research astrophysicist at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And our third panelist, who is below, uh, is Dr. El Sayed Talat uh, with NOAA, uh, specifically with the um, National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, where he's the director of the Office of Projects planning and analysis. Thank you all for, for joining us uh, for this event. And uh, just to get things started uh, and to kind of share some, some topics in sort of a broad sense, uh, each of our panelists have uh, just a few slides uh, to share with information. And so I will switch over to those. And I think uh, Carrie is up first. Thank you, Jason. Here we go. Okay, great. So thank you everybody for being with us today. This is our a beautiful shot of the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope from the summit of Haleakala. Um, construction was recently completed within the last year, and in February of this year, they started taking science observations for the first time, which is incredibly exciting. Um, next slide, please, Jason. So here you can see a couple of movies. These are these are brand new, brand new movies um, that were just released. You can see some really beautiful structures in the solar photosphere. So the photosphere is like the, the bright surface that, um, that you can see 
um, for me, it's on the left. So I'm hoping it's on the left for everybody else as well. You can see these, these uh, little granules, which are also um, on my background behind me. And you can see this fantastic dynamic motion that's happening. Um, on the right is a corresponding image in a, in a different wavelength. And you can see it sort of gets at some different underlying structure, which is really fascinating to study. And we're looking forward to, to seeing what kind of science comes out of the analysis of these types of images. Next slide, please. So we have a couple of upcoming eclipses in October. Um, October 14th of 2023, there's an annular eclipse that's going to traverse the southwest, um, which I'm sure Nikki can give us much more detail on what happens in an annular eclipse, but essentially the moon covers most of the disk of the sun, but not all of it. And then in 2024, there is a total solar eclipse, which is going to traverse basically the Midwest. It sort of goes from Southwest through the Midwest up to the Northeast. Um, so that's a total solar eclipse that happens in April um, of 2024. So we have a really exciting year and a half coming up. Next slide, please. Space weather prediction. This is over to El Sayed, I believe. Yes, thanks. Uh, so space weather refers to the changing conditions on the sun in the near, near, near space uh, environment uh, that can influence the performance or liability of space-borne and ground-based technological systems, and by extension can endanger human life or health. Uh, studying space weather is important to our global economy because solar storms can affect the advanced technology we become so dependent upon in our everyday lives. <laughs> And um, the uh, space weather events are driven by, ultimately, by the sun's uh, volatile activities, result, resulting in high, heightened levels of particle radiation, electromagnetic radiation, such as X-rays that come in uh, the form of solar explosions off the sun, called solar flares, plasmas resulting from large explosions off the sun, called coronal mass ejections, or CME. Uh, these, these, these type of solar storms uh, can uh, solar flares can cause radio blackouts that can impair HF communications, important airlines and emergency responders. Energetic particles can cause surface and deep dielectric charging of spacecraft. And um, uh, geomagnetic storms that, that develop from the solar solar wind and, and coronal mass ejections can, can cause atmospheric heating and increased drag for satellite operations. Additionally, uh, the increased variability driven by these storms in, this, in the Earth's magnetic field can, uh, can cause variability that can induce currents in long conductors at ground level, uh, affecting pipelines and ultimately, uh, and also electric power grids, causing uh, possible outages and, uh, and affecting our infrastructure there. And the uh, ionized portion of the atmosphere in the ionosphere can depart from its, its normal state uh, adversely affecting communications and navigation, including GPS that we use almost every day with our phones. Uh, next slide. So we, we uh, the, 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 the government uh, is, is working on reducing the impact of severe space weather events. And, and this was codified in the PROSWIFT Act, which integrates the national space weather activities and strengthens efforts toward a whole of community approach for space weather. And parts of the, the PROSWIFT Act calls for initiating, initiate the research to improve our understanding of space weather, <coughs> excuse me, ensure the critical observations necessary to inform models, predictions, and warnings, and transition research and capabilities to operations uh, uh, from research and from research to operations and leverage public and private networks of expertise and capabilities. Uh, improving space weather prediction capabilities and enhancing the, and the, enhancing the nation's resilience to space weather will be a multi-year effort requiring sustained commitment to, a multi, it, it, to the multi-agency effort. So NOAA's responsibility in particular is to provide the operational space weather observations and products and services that meet the evolving needs of the nation as we move towards solar maximum, we are preparing for an increase in solar activity and subsequent space weather and working toward becoming a space weather ready nation. 
and I'm handing it off to Nikki. Next slide. Thanks, El Sayed. Um, so I'm so excited to be here and talk to you all today um, about the physics of the sun and what we don't yet understand what we're hoping to understand by um, putting together all of these different resources that, um, that we're talking about. So what I'm showing here is an image of the solar corona. Uh, that's the atmosphere of the sun. This is the part of the sun that we see during a total solar eclipse where the moon totally blocks out the much brighter photosphere of the sun underneath it. An annular eclipse, uh, Carrie mentioned the annular eclipse, is where the moon does not totally block out the photosphere of the sun. It just has to do with the orbit of the moon around the earth. But here what we're, we're seeing is the atmosphere of the sun. Um, and what I love about this composite image, it's a composite of three different images from the 2017 total solar eclipse that was visible from across the United States. And it shows three different ways that we observe the solar corona, the solar atmosphere, and uh, why we need all of these different ways because they each reveal different information about the sun. So in the center is actually an ultraviolet image taken from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, that's a NASA spacecraft. And what you're seeing is structure in the low corona. Um, and you saw a little bit of that really uh, low corona and but in really high detail from Kerry. And the middle is a gray ring there. That middle gray ring is an image taken from the ground of the total solar eclipse in white light. So that's what you can see uh, just with your eye during a uh, total solar eclipse. That's what everybody can see. Then the outside is an image taken by a mission called SOHO, a collaboration of ESA, NASA, uh, multi-agency, international collaboration. And this is a white light image of the outer corona. And we take that with an instrument called a coronagraph, which is a way that our spacecraft take artificial eclipses and block out the photosphere so that we can look at the corona all the time. So by looking at the corona in all of these different ways uh, is how we can study the sun. So some of the physical questions that we don't yet understand are this very corona that we're looking at here. The corona is millions of degrees, which is amazingly hot. Uh, and so this energization of the solar atmosphere is one of the questions that we're trying to understand. The solar corona is hundreds of times hotter than that visible photosphere, that visible surface below. And um, that's like if you walked away from a fireplace and it got a hundred times hotter. So it's a really big question in solar physics. Now we know the answer is the magnetic field that's rooted down in below the photosphere. It threads up through the photosphere and comes up into the corona. And that granular motion that Carrie showed that you saw, that's stirring up that magnetic field. So we know that that stirring of the magnetic field tangles and puts energy into the magnetic field in the corona and it gets released in the corona. And that's part of the solar coronal heating problem, part of the answer. But we don't know exactly where or when or the details of how that happens. So that's one of the things that we're looking into. A related question is the solar wind, which is that hot coronal plasma is not gravitationally bound to the sun. It flies off, uh, sometimes in bursts, sometimes continuously, uh, sometimes really fast, sometimes medium fast. Um, it flies off at a million miles per hour and fills our whole solar system. So that plasma is constantly bombarding the Earth. And I haven't even gotten yet to the big solar storms that Al had talked about. That's just the regular sun and the, like on a regular day. So it constantly makes this bombardment of plasma bombarding all of our planets and the earth. And we don't understand exactly how that solar wind is formed. Um, then on a larger scale and on a longer time scale, we need to understand how the solar dynamo works. That's that magnetic field in the core of the sun that makes those magnetic concentrations. Um, and at solar maximum, when we have more of those magnetic field concentrations, that's when we get more of those big explosions that Al had talked about. We want to understand the solar cycle. We want to understand not just um, that is coronal mass ejection occurred, but what triggered it to go and which direction it's headed? Is it headed towards Earth? Is it headed towards one of the planets? And uh, understanding it well enough that we can predict that in advance. All right, so next slide, please. Um, 
basically together, we're just hoping to put all of these pieces together. And I hope that I conveyed the importance of putting all of these different resources together to really solve this problem. Um, NSF, NOAA, and NASA working together to understand our sun and impact on space and solar system around the earth. I'm showing, we're showing here, um, let's see, Parker Solar Probe and the Inouye Solar Telescope and Solar Orbiter, um, Parker Solar Probe is on its uh, 14th closest approach. It just happened a couple of days ago. So these are different ways that we can study the sun and hopefully get at some of the answers to these questions. Thank you. Jason, we can't hear you. Red means mute. There you go. How about now? Can you hear me now? All right. All right. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, for uh, the rest of the time is for questions from our participants on Zoom and our participants here in the room. And uh, our media contacts for all, each of the three agencies uh, are on screen now. If any of you would like to follow up with questions or interview requests later, we'd be happy to talk to you about those. Um, but with that, I think we're going to open it up to questions. I'm going to go to... Red view so we can see everyone. And if oh, you let me stop sharing. Stop sharing. There we go. Area is very large, but probably whoever speaks is going to be the so focus. Change, change it to the gallery that we want. Yeah. Um, so to the reporters online, um, you didn't hear this spiel before. This is intended to be an informal Q&A with our researchers panel. Um, so if you are comfortable turning on your video, that's great. Um, feel free to turn on your mic or wave your hand and say, I have a question and we'll call on you. Drop a note in the chat. Um, and it's a free for all Q&A session. So turn it over to Jason to moderate. I could start with a, a remedial question. John um, Fahey from AP. Um, this is John Fahey from AP. Uh, with all the fancy solar observatory instruments, why why is an eclipse at all helpful? Like, what what, what are we going to get out of an eclipse that we can't get any yeah. day of the year? Good question. One one or all of you like to tackle that? I can take a first stab. Um, the moon does a really, really good job of blocking out the photosphere. And it's sort of a happenstance that it exactly blocks out the photosphere when we have these total solar eclipses. Um, our artificial eclipses that we create um, are not as good. The scattered light, um, because of the focal length of where we try and block the sun from, the scattered light is really intense. And so uh, actually the moon does a better job. <laughs> And so we can see parts of the corona, sort of this middle part of the corona. Um, the NASA spacecraft do really well at getting like the outer parts. Um, you saw the super high resolution um, dekissed up close, but there's sort of this middle part that the scattered light um, is pretty intense. And so the moon does a better job at blocking uh, out the photosphere. Is there anything in particular that you've seen in recent eclipses like 2017? that you want to follow up on, you know, clues that that the 2017 eclipse revealed that you're especially excited to look into? I can take that one again, I guess. <laughs> There's just, yeah, um, an incredible amount of uh, structure that uh, we can see with the 2017, that we saw with the 2017 eclipse and, and other eclipses as well. Um, anytime we're able to capture that sort of in-between region in the corona um, in high detail, uh, we see structure and dynamics that help us understand that coronal heating problem, uh, the solar wind formation. Um, and if we're lucky, I believe there have been observations of coronal mass ejections during eclipses too, but that's you got to get lucky for that, but um, then you can get detail there during this key acceleration uh, of the coronal mass ejection. I 
I could just add that in 2017, there was a lot of effort by scientists to try to build movies across the entire um, path of the eclipse. And it, you know, it's trial and error, right? It's experiments. Um, so this time around in 2024, uh, folks are improving on what they have done in the past. And so we're hoping that this time we'll have even, even better movies than we did in 2017. Fair question. Well, there's uh, one in chat. We'll read that for you. Megan Bartels from space.com asked and said, if you could learn one particular thing about the sun, what do you think would be the most helpful aspect to be from the space weather perspective? She says she's in a lab room, so she, she's gonna, we're gonna dictate for her. <laughs> well, absolutely from, from what, we, what we would lo love to have is predictive capability of when these storms happen. You know, when if we can predict when a, uh, a, a active region is going to erupt into a solar flare, uh, a, a solar uh, energetic particle event, or a coronal mass ejection, uh, would be key to to you know that would be just an incredible leap of uh, of knowledge that we we would gain uh, to help our predictive capability here. Because right now we we watch these active regions. We put out alerts, uh, similar the way we watch the Atlantic Basin for uh, cyclones uh, coming towards, uh, uh, or tropical storms coming towards uh, uh, the, north, north, the Western Hemisphere, and uh, and then and then, but we we don't really have a way yet uh, of predicting when they're going to erupt and how big of a magnitude uh, and what type of feature that it's what type of sol space weather event is going to happen. So that's. That's definitely uh, uh, what what we're hoping to gain with the knowledge that we're uh, that we that we do with these observations from NSF and NASA and the science that's being done. Did anyone else have anything to add to that one about what you know what what one key insight would be most useful? One is so hard. <laughs> there are so yeah, many, yeah. There are so several, many pieces. Several, uh, space is big. There are a lot of steps along the way, I think, that um, physical steps where uh, we know a lot of the story, but not quite all of it. Oh, I, I completely agree. It's like saying I, I, I would like to predict earthquakes, you know, so so yes, we would we definitely uh, that's the ultimate goal, uh, but we absolutely have uh, a lot of uh, a science to do uh, before we get there. Amber. Hi, Amber Dance. I'm with the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. Following up on that, uh, that question, if you could make those predictions, what actions would you then be able to take to protect human life and so forth? So with 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 those uh, with those, with that capability, uh, we'd be able to give our stakeholders uh, a, um, a, a longer lead time to take actions. So, for instance, the power grid uh, would know exactly what time to take mitigative uh, mitigative measures. Uh, uh, the uh, for instance, astronauts and uh, people doing uh, humans in in uh, traveling in space would know uh, that there's a likelihood of, a, of an adverse, adverse conditions that they need to take shelter or launches could be delayed, uh, et, et cetera. So it would provide us additional lead time um, to, to basically give warning to our stakeholders. Uh, airlines uh, also could uh, um, uh, uh, plan. Uh, or, uh, I think we, we, lost, we lost you for just a second there, El Sayed. Can you repeat your last sentence? Oh, sure. Airlines, airlines, for instance, could um, uh, plan to divert flights where they would have uh, where they would uh, would have a likelihood of bad communications uh, and or an ad, uh, uh, um, a dangerous particle environment. Um, so, so it would provide us additional lead time and also provide us additional uh, um, 
bounds about when when the stakeholders need to take action uh, so that they can plan can make their their plans uh, more exact more definite and uh, and and thereby thereby optimize their response so what kind of lead time do you get now and what what would you hope to have well when we we basically are reactive right now when we see uh, explosions on the sun. So, so we monitor um, just like, just like the, the, the eclipse that we're having now, that we're going to have now in 2024, 20, uh, the total eclipse, uh, that's, that's uh, um, a, a way of observing the, the nature's way for us to observe the corona. Uh, we have uh, uh, instruments uh, called coronagraphs that do an eclipse uh, uh, that, that uh, have a, a false eclipse on the sun, uh, or uh, uh, occlude the sun, and, and look at the corona, and we look for explosions off the sun. And from that, uh, when there when an explosion happens, from the trajectory and the size of the explosion, we estimate if it's going to come uh, towards Earth, and that gives us a one uh, one to three days uh, uh, warning, uh, for instance. And so. So, and then from that trajectory, we have an uncertainty about whether, whether it's going to reach Earth or not that gets better as, as, uh, as uh, that we can validate, I should say, as, as, we, as it approaches the, the Sun-Earth line. And we have monitors, upstream monitors, um, the Discover mission uh, uh, that measures the, the solar wind and tells us if that large explosion is indeed coming towards Earth. And that's, that's, that's only 15 minutes to an hour away uh, uh, from the Earth. So those are the two sort of warning time scales we have. So okay. one to three days that something is coming and 15 to 60 minutes uh, uh, that something is here. And we, we, we definitely need to take, uh, uh, we need to warn our, our stakeholders to take action if they can. So um, uh, being able to predict the, the an event uh, and uh, the size and magnitude and, and possible, if you're able to predict when the event happens, then you can be, then you're also able to uh, predict where it happens on the sun in the rotation of the sun. So it gives you an idea of whether it's going to be earth directed or not. And so, so that'll give us a longer lead time right now that something is coming. And then, and then, uh, another goal of ours is to get, uh, um, longer lead time in that upstream monitoring, that upstream buoy, uh, that that we can have, we can understand what the solar wind looks like before it reaches Earth. Uh, beyond that, um, uh, the L1 point, which is a million miles towards the sun, something closer to that, uh, something closer to the sun would give us longer lead time uh, as well. That's another goal of ours uh, from a predictive capability. Thank you. Is it trite to you who look at fusion all day when, to see that we just on Earth did a little <laughs> bit of fusion today? And you're like, <laughs> really? Not at all. Excited it's quite it? exciting. <laughs> quite exciting. <laughs> well, I, I don't, I don't want to step on anyone with any questions, but one thing, um, one thing might be of interest, and maybe uh, Carrie, maybe you could speak to this. Would be, um, I believe, uh, the Inouye Telescope to the National Solar Observatory, who our colleagues are right here, by the way. Congratulations! Uh, just released their first publicly available data set ever uh, yesterday, I think. Um, so maybe, maybe that's something you could share some information about. Yeah, absolutely. This is very exciting. So um, like I said earlier, the first observations were taken in February and the first data sets were released to the data center um, just recently. It was made available to the public. Well, the press release for the for the public release of the data was, was yesterday. The data that's available to the public and the scientific community um, right now is data that was taken during um, a coordinated observation with Parker, 
um, and so with Parker Solar Probe and uh, with Solar Orbiter. And I believe that data was collected in June. Um, Valentin, the director of NSO, who's sitting right behind Jason there, um, could, could give you the, the exact date. So, so this is very exciting. We are really looking forward to seeing what's going to come um, now that people have access to that particular data. Um, data that was taken uh, through science experiments, essentially, DKIST, um, the Inaway Solar Telescope does essentially experiments. Um, that data has been released to the principal investigators. Um, there's a proprietary period of six months. So they have six months to work on the data, and then it's released to the public as well. So six months from now, there will be even more data available. Thank you. Uh, those were the two. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So the two, the two videos. Yeah, courtesy of the National Solar Observatory. Uh, yeah, were the two in the slideshow. Um, cool. Any more questions? Folks yeah. online. Don't be shy. Yeah. <laughs> I should add that at this AGU meeting just yesterday, there was a special session on um, first results from the Inouye Solar Telescope, which is a really, really, really exciting. The preliminary results are starting to come out. So it's just the initial analysis of the data uh, in the next year. I'm hoping that we'll see some really fantastic physical results of it, but it's very exciting to see the super high resolution data and to see these very small, the very small scale features that in a way Solar tel Telescope really excels at very small scale features. Um, that are that are incredibly important, but what they're starting to show now is that the the telescope can capture these small scale features, which are on the scale of um, of simulations of structures that you see in simulations, and so now we'll really be able to compare theory with reality on the surface of the sun, which is tremendously exciting and really going to propel the science forward. What was the most surprising thing in that first look at the data? There, there's something that you didn't expect or just really excited to see confirmed? For me, the most exciting thing was to see these waves propagate through granules. So I haven't had a lot of time to talk to the scientists about what their results show. Um, and again, this is all very preliminary. They're not they're not near the um, the publication stage yet. But but what was new to me was to see that these magnetohydrodynamic waves essentially propagate through a granule. Um, I I hadn't seen that before. It's it's possible the experts who do this on a day-to-day -day basis had uh, anticipated that type of activity. Um, but for me, that was really, really cool. I had a I had a follow-up question for El Sayed actually. Earlier in your presentation, you used a term of art called uh, solar maximum. And I was wondering if you could describe what you meant by that and what as we approach what it means, what that portends for the future as we approach it. Sure, um, so uh, the, 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 the sun goes through uh, an 11 year cycle of, of activity. Um, and we're right now approaching a, uh, a solar maximum period when uh, the sun's energy output uh, uh, reaches that uh, maximum in, in the 11 years. Uh, so I, I believe the, 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 the maximum is predicted for 2025. Um, and, and during, during solar maximum, you have, uh, peak amounts of, of, uh, electromagnetic radiation, uh, uh, output from the sun, uh, as well as, uh, uh, the, the increase in the, in the, the ionized, uh, ionized particles and, and electrons coming from the sun in the, in the form of the solar wind, and as well as an increase in, in, some of these uh, 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 what we call space weather events, so like solar flares um, uh, uh, and and possible coronal mass ejections. So statistically speaking, you see more of these uh, in in solar maximum, and in and particularly on the decline from the solar maximum, the 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 climb down from solar maximum. 
uh, 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 is 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 what we we expect to see. Um, so uh, we expect to see more of these uh, l larger storms. Uh, so 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 that's that that is that is something we look we look out for because obviously um, uh, as we as our technological infrastructure has been built up, it becomes more much more more susceptible. Uh, to these storms, and then we are just coming out of out of a very very quiet period. Uh, our the solar minimum that we've had recently has been uh, statistically lower and statistically longer uh, than than we've seen in the in the, in the space age uh, so far. And so so um, uh, now we're going to start seeing a ramp up of activity. And though though predictions have varied. It is likely to be um, the the ramp up so far uh, towards solar maximum is a little little higher than what was predict on the kind of the consensus prediction. Uh, so we might see a, a slightly larger solar maximum than was originally predicted, which was originally predicted to be kind of a, um, a middling or low uh, uh, maximum period. Uh, but um, as we saw recently from from um, you know the 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 Starlink uh, um, uh, episode where they lost uh, um, uh, several spacecraft in a launch. Even even uh, mild space weather activity, mild uh, uh, space weather activity can have adverse effects uh, because we are pushing the the edges of technology uh, um, uh, with our with our infrastructure right now. And so so uh, more and more. More and more attention is going to be need to be spent on on what are the possible effects of of, of space weather um, as we ramp up in, in in activity. Thank you. And I'm sure Nikki or Carrie can add more about the solar cycle as well. Well, just to say that it's going to be um, really cool timing that the 2024 eclipse will be on that approach to solar maximum in contrast to the 2017 eclipse which was a different part of the solar cycle so that's a cool thing to see the sun in the same way but during a different phase of its cycle um, and also nasa has um, you know missions that are up now like parker solar probe and solar orbiter that are measuring the sun that will watch as this um, as this ramp up happens Corey Powell reporting for the Wall Street Journal asks, how much progress are you making in understanding why some solar cycles are more intense than others? What are the biggest gaps to fill? That's a tough one, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> uh, what, what I can say is that the, that the, 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 the predictions from the last solar cycle and this solar cycle have been wide and varied. <laughs> so I think I think we are, uh, but that's that's not a bad thing necessarily. What what I, I think we're seeing is the scientific method uh, happening uh, in real time, in a sense that people are using different different uh, uh, um, assumptions, different techniques to to um, extrapolate and predict the solar cycle. Uh, and we'll see what which which ones come out, which ones shake out uh, 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 in the in the uh, and 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 with with better predictions. Now we're going to be still in statistics of small numbers because uh, we we only get solar cycles every eleven years, uh, but it still should be um, uh, uh, illustrative and and hopefully insightful. Uh, when 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 we see the results, when when it ultimately happens, um, and I I would also say that I I think uh, a lot of this is tied to the interior of the sun, uh, which which we which we are yet really um, starting to probe, um, and then as Carrie mentioned, these magnetic waves are are going to be key to understanding what the what the activity on the on this uh, that the, observing these magnetic waves and the interaction and their interaction at the at the surface will be key to understanding what's going on um uh, on the interior so so that's something that i, I uh, these new observations uh should help us with 
since El Sayed mentioned the interior of the sun, I thought I, I might bring up that it is one of the things that the National Solar Observatory uh, studies with its Global Oscillation Network group. Um, and this is a, it's, it's a really, really cool story that this was something that started as a very simple experiment in the, in the 90s and has become essential for um, for the operational community. So NOAA and the Air Force use the um, the data that comes out of that network as well. And we're, we're looking towards the next generation of this network as well. On a personal note, helioseismology, the study of the interior of the sun was actually one of the first things I encountered about the sun in grad school. Uh, from an NCAR scientist, and I thought it was the coolest thing. He showed this image. Um, it was, you know, it was just a schematic of what the sun might look like uh, with all of these modes. And the idea of the sun ringing like a bell was just absolutely mind blowing to me. I thought this is so fantastic. I have to study this. That's cool. Uh, so I'm Becca, just in our last couple of minutes here. Um, I work for Pfizer and Media Relations. I have a follow-up for Carrie, actually. You were talking about um, the importance of looking for really small-scale features here that maybe haven't but we haven't been able to image before. So I'm curious if there are any features in particular that have been theorized or modeled but haven't been found yet that would be really important or exciting to come across with this telescope. Well, I could tell you from a little bit of my own background um, what we're looking for. So very, 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 very small scale features are potentially responsible for um, energy release on the sun. So things like coronal mass ejections and, and solar flares being um, released through a phenomenon called magnetic reconnection, which I'm happy to talk about in detail. Nikki can talk about in detail. She's the expert here. Um, but uh, one of the challenges in the modeling of these things is that the you have these very, very large, large structures, but the release of a big bubble off the sun, for instance, it sort of hinges on what happens on a super, super small scale. Uh, and so the simulations can get down to a particular resolution, but none of the observations could get down to, to that scale to actually measure what was happening with energy release. Uh, so this is something that this is something that we're expecting um, the Inouye Solar Telescope to be able to shed some light on um, that, that I think is really cool, personally very, very cool. I think if I can add one of the things that I think we're starting to see on the sun, but also in the earth and the magnetosphere and across the solar system is the importance of cross scale dynamics and feedback, which is all of the small stuff that they're seeing now that Carrie's been talking about. It doesn't just happen in isolation. It talks to like middle scale stuff, which talks to the global scales. And then that goes back down again. The big scales talk to the middle scales, which then talk to the little scales. And so we have to put this all together, the big um, global picture through those middle scales down to the small scales. And I think that's how we're really gonna understand the physics of what's going on. Any, yeah, it was a great answer. Any, any last questions? Oh, there's one chat. Yeah, quick follow up from Corey Powell with the Wall Street Journal. Love to hear a little more about the next generation Helio seismology experiments. What are they and what are their top goals? This is a question that is best answered by Valentin Pillay, who is who is sitting behind Jason. Um, but let's see. Oh, what I can tell you is that one of the one of the focuses of um, of the actually maybe we'll just turn it over to Valentin and let me not say something that's incorrect. <laughs> Now, let me follow up from what uh, Carrie was saying. When we started the Golden Network, it was not really thought for doing everything that it's doing now. Uh, then we were improving the network, and now it's providing a service to a broader community. What we're doing with the next generation Gong is to incorporate all the new knowledge that we have about how the solar magnetic fields evolve, but also about the solar interior. In particular, uh, we are able to not only observe the solar interior, with the Gong network, we're also able to sense the far side of the sun, the part of the sun that is not facing the earth. 
But we're doing this not with the resolution and with the sensitivity that we really want to have. With the next generation Gong network, that's how we call it, we're going to be able to really design the network from the beginning to have the right sensitivities that we need to actually start predicting conditions for space weather much before they occur, much before they are facing the Earth. So we're incorporating knowledge that we have learned over three decades. Uh, when uh, Gong was built was three decades ago. So we have all this new knowledge that we will be now putting into the next generation Gong network. And we're excited to start the project. And thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, thank you to all of our speakers and our special guests, yeah, too. Yeah, my, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you to everyone online. But this session has been recorded, so we'll make it available on ADU's YouTube channel. It'll be a press, fall press um, playlist that you can find it in. We'll also post that to the Press Information Exchange, which is available to registered reporters to find, along with the slides. And we'll try to get some links to some of those videos that were shown. <laughs> um, and otherwise, thank you for coming. And we'll see you tomorrow morning. Um, we have a press conference in the press conference room, which is across the hall from us here in Chicago or online. Um, you can find that link online. Um, and that is about oncoming storms and flooding around the world. So we hope to see you there on Wednesday morning. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, that was fun.